Howdy! My name is Katherine Scott. I'm the developer advocate for an organization called Open Robotics. I'm here to talk about ROS2, where ROS stands for Robot Operating System, 2 stands for 2, and basically we're going to talk about free open source software for building production level robots. Alright, so the classic overview in five parts. I'm going to start with some social proof because um, I think that helps sometimes keep people motivated and uh, gets it's the hook. Talk a little bit about the history of the project, the philosophy, and then what's in the box in ROS2 and sort of the community that surrounds it and what's up. Alright, so ROS. Uh, why should you care about ROS? So ROS stands for Robot Operating System. It is not an operating system. It's more like a layer that you drop on top of your operating system that runs just like Linux and makes it suitable for robots. Um, and ROS is probably the largest, oldest, fastest growing ecosystem uh, for robotics and it's also free and open source software unlike some of the others. Um, so ROS2 in particular, in the past couple years we've built um, a ROS2 technical steering committee. Um, there's still a huge and growing community of core devs and people who are defining direction, but we've also been working with these um, very, very large organizations to sort of plot a future for robotics, and particularly robotics for things like manufacturing and autonomous vehicles and um, all of the things in life that we think robots are going to do. and, and make our lives much easier, the Star Trek future that we all wanted. Um, one thing I like to talk about with ROS, um, if you're not familiar with ROS, this will all be new news. If you're familiar with ROS 1 or maybe where ROS was a few years ago, some of the stuff may come as a surprise to you. Um, so I personally, this is, this is hard information to come by, I personally maintain a list of companies that are using ROS, so over almost 300 companies on that list. Um, there are Fortune 50 companies, there are small startups, there's everything in between, and this is just what I know about. This is the BSD license problem where um, you put something out in the world and you don't know who uses it unless they complain on a forum or like put it in a job solicitation or something like that. So these are the ones I know about and I've only been doing this for like six, eight months. Um, uh, a more robust metric that I think people would be familiar with is uh, last year, 2019, we had 264 million ROS dev downloads, which is quite a few. We have 35,000 users on our own Q&A forum. We have over 5,000 users on our just general ROS discourse forum. Um, I did a search the other day on GitHub for all the projects that are tagged specifically with ROS, there were over 2,000 of those, and those are the ones that are tagged, like we don't even tag some of ours, so there's more than that. We keep a wiki, and the wiki is actually an older ROS1 version, mainly, there's a lot of relevant information there, but still, that wiki gets 200,000 visits a month, which makes it a pretty sizable operation, and then uh, we just wrapped up conference season, so ICRA, the big robotics conference, just wrapped up. We're now at uh, over 7,000 research citations for ROS. We maintain a website called metrics.ros.org that I would encourage you to go take a look at because it kind of distills some of this down and if you don't believe me that ROS is a big project, well, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. Um, the other thing that, you know, I think helps now is that one of the biggest complaints about ROS and taking ROS from, say, something that was used in research to something that is used in production or used in you know, big manufacturing facilities and, and big industrial warehouse was, oh, we don't support Windows, so we can't use it. Well, it turns out now we do. Microsoft's actually helping out a little bit with this. So we now have a toehold for all these raw systems into this sort of Microsoft world. And I think this is actually great. I think this allows us to start getting more and more open source out into these places where I think we want open source to be. Um, so I wanted to give sort of an overview of the history of the project if you weren't aware and I think you know with with almost all technology and I, I certainly found this when I was in school that if you talk about the history of how something was developed you can kind of really understand why things are a certain way and why they're put together in that way. So in the before times I had to go find an image of like uh, you know, robots manufacturing stuff in the 80s or, or so, or the, even the 90s. It was this big, huge, industrial, capitally intensive manufacturing operations moved to robotics. Um, it was very, it was either that or it was, you know, research student or 
research projects at university focus very much on the dull, the dirty, the dangerous, at least in 3Ds and robotics, and you know, capital intensive or, or research grade. The, the software in these organizations was like you'd expect for these large organizations. It was proprietary. It ran on Windows 95. It was bespoke for the application. It had weird hardware controllers that had weird daughter boards that go into your PC to do stuff. Um, there were these system integrators that come in and, and would, you know, wire and glue and duct tape put all these things together and you are very much leaning on your vendors to do things and the vendor API that if it was on the web it's behind a paywall or you know behind a registration wall in a password protected zip file and that was the before times so about 2004 so this is right when I'm getting out of college there's something started changing something kind of clicked and I in my mind this may not be the only thing but this is sort of the watershed moment is DARPA the did um, defense advanced research projects agency for the US says hey we're gonna put together this competition we're gonna put a bunch of money out there and we're gonna ask all these universities and organizations to give us your best vehicle that can drive by itself outdoors and they put together this competition and you know this things were like it actually kind of worked it didn't work great but vehicles were actually able to go as a non-trivial distance outside and not fall off the road and do what they were supposed to do. Sort of concurrently with all of those things happening in 2004, you know, Google wasn't as, you know, dominant as it is now. But in 2004 it was when Google had its IPO. So all of a sudden these people working there and working in Silicon Valley are flush with cash. Um, and, I, and the reason I point out Google specifically is Google is one of these orgs that has at least had you know, strong opinion. You know, strong opinions about open source and actually using open source to do what it is they do. And so, all of these things are stirring in a pot in Silicon Valley in you know, 2004, 2005, 2006. And it's we have these autonomous robots. We have money. We have open source doing all these cool Web 2.0, as it was called, stuff. And at some point somebody says, well, I'm going to leave Google and I'm going to try to take this this whole idea of free open source software and apply it to these robots and see if we can really push robotics forward. And that organization is called Willow Garage. You may have heard of it. Um, and Willow's, you know, core belief was like, let's use open source to solve the robotics problem and build all these cool robots that we were all promised when we watched TV in the 90s. Right? And so from Willow Garage and all of this venture capital and, and money from Google come three great open open software projects, right? There's OpenCEV, which if you're not familiar, it stands for Open Computer Vision. Um, it's basically a collection of, you know, all of the primitives that you need to build a robust computer vision application. So it's like, hey, I need to find the lines in something, or I need to like change the colors in something, or I need to find a face. There's PCL, which is um, Point Cloud Library. Point Cloud Library, at the same time you start seeing the first like Microsoft Connects and all of these cool 3D sensors. The thing that allowed, um, in the urban and grand challenges, that allowed people to to, to win, right, to dominate, was really these uh, Velodyne LiDARs, these spinning LiDARs. And those generate point clouds. And you need tools to analyze those point clouds, so let's put them all in a library. It's called PCL. And finally, ROS, which stands for Robot A Offering System, and that was the same thing. It was, let's take all of these things that researchers had, had built, onesie, twosie, at each university, and they built the same thing over and over again. Let's put them all in a standard library and start seeing what we can build. Um, sort of concurrently, uh, Willow did a lot of work just to build robots that weren't products, to, to build robots to build roboticists that could build those products, right? They laid the groundwork for this sort of next generation of roboticists. And they built two things. They built a small robot that was really suitable for undergraduates, graduate students, to get their hands on and play with and get dirty. And that was called the TurtleBot. We still make them. And then they built this big, cool, does everything you'd ever want, like multiple arms, all the sensors, mobile robot called the Pier 2, Personal Robot 2. And they just kind of shipped them off to all of these different research facilities across the globe. And so they ship all these ro robots everywhere and they start sort of incubating and collaborating and talking. And all of these different research groups all around the world are, are 
are talking and listening and building and sharing their code in, in, in what we would consider now very modern ways. And they start, you know, how do we build a project? How do we do, you know, build up the standard library of robot components across the globe? Um, and so sort of from that ethos comes these, these sets of ideas that I kind of call like the ethos of Ross, right? Um, the first one is sort of federation over centralization, I know, or, you know, decentralization. Um, you know, and we're kind of coming back to that now in, I think, a lot of ways. But, if, you know, federation really means, hey, we're going to have a bunch of people. We're all, you know, working together the same cause, but we're all sort of compartmentalized and do our own thing. Let's figure out a way to do that smart. Um, and that really, you can see that in, like, our build tools and, and how things are packaged. Um, you know, and then the next thing is very much the Linux ethos, which is small, simple, composable programs that you can string together to do cool stuff. Um, third one should be self-evident. Don't reinvent the wheel. Let's build shared common tools. The other two are, are kind of hard to define, but the first is non-exclusive. Like, um, ROS and all of the associated tools, they work really well. Um, in C++, but there are also, you know, you can build build them with Python and you can interop them with other things like Java and JavaScript and I saw something for Rust the other day, right? So we're not going to say like, we're going to build all these tools and we're not going to say you can't play with us because you're using a language we don't like. It's more about bringing all those people in. And then sort of concurrently, I would say inclusive. Um, and, and that's maybe not well defined, but you know, I think this is the biggest misconception about ROS, and it is that um, people say, oh, I can either use ROS or I can use this other thing. And the reality of the world is it's not an is or, or you know, is or thing. It is a in addition to. So you can take from this library what you want, that what, what helps you, and the things that you don't like, the things you don't want to use, well, you can, you can find something else. And that's perfectly okay. Um, and then the, the last one is freedom, which I think everyone gets is the non-restrictive licenses. Go do what you're going to go do in the world. Um, sadly, uh, my great illustration here in 2003 or 2013, Willow folds and the open source is kind of sitting there and a bunch of people working with it kind of picked it up and we formed two new, or, you know, one organization first with Open Robotics, which is sort of the steward of all, um, at least Ross. And then we have a couple partner organizations now that, that help us take that code and, and make it suitable for other applications. So it's still living on, it's still going, and there's still an organization that's really, really driving this work. Okay, so what happened? So, you know, around 2018, we'd gone through and we released a ton of different versions of ROS. Basically, we're releasing it every, you know, once or twice a year and having like longer LTS versions and then, um, you know, intermediate versions where we're just sort of working out new features. And 2018 comes on and we start talking with people and we realize that, you know, probably now we've learned everything we're going to learn. There's actually some things that need to change to make ROS better. And we decide to start working on ROS too. And so, you know, at, at 2018, we basically start winding down, um, ROS 1 production and we start really ramping up on ROS 2 production to the point where like uh, ROS 1 is basically, you know, there's not going to be another version release. The community can keep doing as they please, but it, it's not under active development. Um, so anyway, working with the TSC, we sort of identified how we could make ROS better. Like if we had to make a whole new version, what would we do? What needs to get fixed? What would make it suitable for all of these different use cases, not just for researchers but for everyone and so we've iterated a few times we're now on the sixth version we're at uh, Rocks, uh, ROS2 Foxy Fitzroy and this is a LTS it's got three years I was actually going through the API docs I think they're fairly you know there's still a little bit of work to do but I think they're they've sort of stabilized and they're they're ready for people to use and it's got a bunch of new features and I, I'm gonna kinda go through and talk about what's in there um, and I'm going to talk about also the philosophy of how we do things. And, you know, I think everyone talks a lot about Python and like the Zen of Python and how we do stuff or how Python does stuff. Um, and I think Ross is sort of similar things. I'm not going to say this is the canonical version, but it's, it's like I said before, it's like, don't reinvent the wheel, build your common tools, uh, defer to federate, you know, do federation versus, uh, centralization, 
build small, simple, composable utilities, be non-exclusive, be inclusive, and generally, you know, default to freedom, which is non-exclusive licenses or non-restrictive licenses. Okay, so let's talk about the parts of what you're going to find in ROS. And, you know, before you even talk about ROS, let's talk about your basic robot. And your basic robot has three parts. It's got actuators, like we got actuators. It's got sensors, like we have sensors, um, which are things that take in data. And then it's got something to make sense of that data and do something with the actuators, right? So I have three different bits of clipboard here. Um, and so let's talk about the first sort of wheel that we're not reinvented, or you're, you're not going to have to reinvent if you use ROS, right? And the first is just multi-process control. And I like I know that sounds kind of weird, um, but let me describe what's going on in ROS and at a high level, and then you can go take a look at the code yourself. So ROS nodes are basically process encapsulation between languages. And what I mean by that is um, all of your ROS nodes are going to interoperate. They're going to be doing stuff together. One might be written in C++, one might be written in Python, one might be written in something else they all have a basically a standard way that they're going to operate with ROS, right? Um, they're going to have a standard way that they compile and be installed. Um, you're going to have some tools to start them, stop them, pause them, query their status, and collect your CLI. So you're just saying, if you're going to build a ROS program, it's going to roughly look like this. Um, and what we do is we gather these nodes into um, into packages, and a package is just a collection of software. Could be multiple nodes, could be one, and these packages come with their build instructions and your testing and all you know all of the things like it's a, for lack of a better word, it's a library, right? It's a package of things. Um, and so the the way I make sense of this when talking about ROS nodes is that. Um, imagine if it weren't this way. Imagine if we didn't build tooling around uh, all these different programs that are going to be talking and doing stuff. Um, imagine writing the shell script that starts a bunch of C++ and Python programs that they all kind of need to come up concurrently. All of them are interfacing with different bits of hardware, right? So they're interfacing with some camera that does weird stuff when it starts up or some other system that uh, does something when it starts up um, with lots and lots of configurable params like the input of this thing needs to be renamed the output of, or the output of this thing needs to be renamed so it goes in the input of this thing so all the pipes need to be managed and there might be like some flow control in there so you're just going to end up with this gnarly five six hundred line right shell script if you have a large robot so we basically built some utility on top of it so you the nodes are this encapsulation of of you know, your process, right? If you're familiar with Python, it's kind of like arg parse plus main plus a couple other things. And then the tooling to start all of them. So now that we got all these different nodes, we have to figure out how to wire them up. What's the glue that like takes all these process, you know, inner process communication? What is the glue that makes them all work together? Um, and so ROS nodes uh, communicate over what we call topics. Um, topics are basically a pub sub bus. If you're familiar with RabbitMQ, zero in Q, <coughs> zero in Q, um, Protoboff, like it's it's the same thing. It's our spin on it, and it kind of predates a lot of them. And it's all based on having very very standard messages, or messages with their types included that allow you to move data between you know different languages in different processes smoothly. And then it's a bunch of tooling on top of it. And so the, the message thing is really important to remember because the messages are sort of, a lot of them are standardized around common things in robotics. So things like images or like motion control or transforms. They're, you've already got this sort of standard library of types moving around through this system. Um, and what's really, really cool about topics, and I've, I've talked about this, is they, they help you with your code do two things. The first is really, really good at helping with loose coupling. So, and I, you know, I see this when I work with younger engineers, not very good at decoupling things. And, you know, this is how you, you decouple your robotic system very, very nicely. So you get nice modular code. Um, 
you're just defining the inputs, defining outputs, and then you're building the small process modules in between. Um, and it also kind of gives you a level of plug and play, right? So like if you see here in my little illustration, I, I yanked out the, the eyeball and placed it with a camera, right? And so in ROS, and this has happened to me in the past, right? You have um, your robot, it's got cameras on it, you don't like the cameras, uh, you yank those cameras out, you put on a different kind of new camera, it's not a lot of work to do that. And the reason is, is that uh, all of the cameras just publish camera messages and to the rest of the system, it doesn't even see or care what's going on. Um, there's a bunch of other things going on, uh, especially in ROS2. Uh, there's a lot of capabilities for introspection of these messages, what they're doing. Um, you can actually define quality of services. And I'm not gonna get too into this, but it's worth digging into later on your own. It's built, all of this is built as an abstraction on a system called DD, or it's not necessarily based on DDS, but more often than not, it's based on DDS. And these DDS systems basically give you somebody, uh, you know, someone to talk to about like, well, how se secure is the system? What do we do? You know, we need it to do X, Y, and Z. And it basically allows this online or the implement, the underlying implementation of the pub sub to be pushed off into different implementations. And, you know, those implementations can come from a vendor or they can come from open source. Um, as I said before, there's all this sort of cool introspection capability on top of it. There's a bunch of command line tools to do that introspection, but this is also your, your you know, slide of sexy plots. There's also visualization tools that are built on top of it. So in particular, it's um, this one is called Arviz. So Arviz will let you see all these camera images. It'll let you see all this 3D point cloud data. It'll let you see the maps that the robot makes. And you're able to sort of pick and choose these different uh, topics all at once and put them on your screen and decide what you want to look at. And you can also kind of look at them in context, right? So you can take an image, you know, if your camera's up here and as you know your 3D position, your 3D models, you can like project it on the things. And it's very, very helpful for understanding what your robot's doing. So, oh, take a step here. Another thing that I, I see people reinventing, and, and I really hope people don't reinvent, is basically serialization. When you have a robot, you're generating a lot of data, and you need to either save that data for machine learning, you need to save it because it's just a part of logging and you want to understand what it failed. Um, so with ROS, what we've done is we've got all these messages serialized, they're moving all over. All we have to do is kind of like tap into that message stream and build a utility that dumps it to disk highly efficiently. And we've done that, it's called a bag. And so these bag files are, are great for, you know, debug and failure analysis, logging, really, really good for collecting machine learning data. Um, they're just all around a wonderful, wonderful utility and there's so much functionality you should never go in and rebuild that. At least I hope you never would want to because it's it's really quite great. I mean, you can take a bag file, a short bag file from your robot and as you're building your unit test, hook up the bag file and replay the data to run the unit test to verify that it works. You can run your robot, collect a bunch of data, send it off to be labeled and then do your machine learning training and it's just automatically packaged like that, um, which is that's sort of my background. It's it's very, very handy. You can take a bunch of data. Say you have, um, I saw this the other day. I thought there was a cool application. Like, say you have this really cool sensor that's still a prototype. You can collect a bunch of data and then package it up and send it to a collaborator somewhere else and they can use it and kind of use it as a simulated sensor on their robot. And then the other really, really handy, handy thing is like bags aren't logs, but if you're going through a log file, right, and something on your robot blew up and you want to know why that happened like you can go through first you see the log then you go back through your bag file and look at when that happened and what data was going in the machine and you can kind of trace back into this input was what the robot saw that made it do the thing that I don't think it should have done so um, you don't have to take my word for it like bags are basically starting to become de facto standards for data sharing among people building advanced autonomy applications and other sort of robotic applications. So Ford just released a huge data set from their autonomous car efforts. Um, on the right I have another data set from like ETH Zurich. Um, 
people just find this a really handy way to share and collaborate, right? Because you just take your robot, run it, say bag this data, you know, once the robot's done, you just take the bag and copy it up to the web and it's out there and it's ready to go. It's very, very handy. Um, another thing that you, you shouldn't reinvent on your robot is basically, you know, how do you do, how do you build really good synchronous and asynchronous APIs for robot behavior? <laughs> I, I've seen people kind of come from non-robotics background and try to do this and they never seem to do it right. So we, we basically have two things in ROS that are your behavior primitives. The first one is your synchronous behavior primitive API. So that's called, we call that a service. And that's anything, it's just basically a framework for doing anything that would be simple on your robot. Like um, in an autonomous car, it'd be lock the doors, turn on the light, um, flash a blinker. Well, flash a blinker's a little weird, but any of those simple things, there's an API to do that. And then there's also an API to do complex asynchronous behaviors. The canonical example of an asynchronous behavior in robotics is your robots, you know, your Roomba is on that side of the room. There's a bunch of stuff in the way and you want your robot to get to the far side of the room. And so that can't happen. Unfortunately, it can't violate physics. It can't go from over here to over here instantly. And there's a process of doing that. And it's not just an asynchronous function call, it's an asynchronous function call that handles like um, negotiation of the request. So sometimes, you know, a robot can be very busy, it can't actually do it. So it'll tell you it can do it. Um, and then as it is performing that particular action, it will, you know, tell you its progress. So I'm going from A to B, and I'm going to tell you how far along that path I am and where I am at any given time. And then it's also going to support preemption, uh, which is nice. And all of these are done mostly through callbacks, uh, so you don't, you know, you don't have to worry about how you're going to handle all that async. You're just sort of filling in the steps of that state machine and going to town. And I, I think this basically allows you to build very, very robust behaviors very, very quickly. Um, I think the thing that people who are interested in robotics, who are coming into robotics, whether for work or just for education, the thing that's most intimidating um, are, is geometry and kinematics and like understanding where everything is on a robot, right? So within our simple robot, right, the hands have a frame of reference I put right here, the sensors have a frame of reference over here, and the, the brain also has a sort of global view of the world. And, you know, the problems that people consider hard is where, where is this particular part of the robot? Where is this thing with respect to the world? How do I get from A to B? Um, you know, can I see this thing and grab it? How do I grasp it? And a bunch of other sort of problems, right? So in Ross, um, we, we already have all the utilities to handle, uh, you know, the geometry of robot. And so the first one is something called universal robot description format and or URDF, which sounds Swedish or something, but an URDF is basically a file that defines the 3D geometry of your robot and all of its joints. And what you can do is you can take your CAD software and some of them will allow you to export it. And you export this whole 3D model of the robot. Now you can see it in that RVIS thing I showed you earlier. Now you can do basically like, what is the position of this thing with respect to this thing? All of that's already baked in. Um, along with this, there's something we call TF2 or Transform2. So Transfer2 will say like, um, is a set of utilities that'll do all the fancy math, all the things that people consider hard uh, to tell, you know, where th one thing is with respect to another. So, uh, you know, if your camera right has a field of view and it's looking out and your arm is moving, it's sort of, you can answer questions like, is my hand in front of the camera? Or, you know, uh, well, all these different sort of problems, right? All of the kinematic links inside the robot, it can tell you where they are and answer like where they are with respect to one another. So my little illustration here, basically, it's just TF2 does the uh, position from like say pixel back to your actuator. So now that your robot sort of knows where it's everything is and where all the positions of the joints are, um, the next thing that people want to do is they want to figure out how do I go from, you know, especially with like a, an arm, 
so like a five axis arm or six axis arm. I see a thing, I need to go get the arm to get there. Um, and so solving that problem is basically a library or a set of tools inside of ROS, and it's called Move It. It's sort of the subgroup within the whole ROS community. And Move It is this is the set of all the tools you would need to do kinematics. And it's it's very, very well done. It has lots and lots of different implementations. It allows you to um, build robust applications around picking and placing in arms without really having to know underneath the hood how all these things work. So it's quite a valuable utility. Um, along with movement, there's also what we call the, the nav stack. Um, so the nav stack basically does two things. It does SLAM, which stands for simultaneous, simultaneous localization and mapping. So what happens is if you have, like, say, a Roomba-like or a you know, small autonomous robot, it drives around a room and it figures out where everything is and it builds up a really, really basic map and then it can do navigation around that area. And that's just a feature set that's available in ROS as a set of tools. Um, I have a little, this little video I, I stole from the, the NAV website, right? And you can see basically the map of the robot and the path planning around it. And this is all ready to go to be dropped onto your robot as an open source library. Um, another thing we should talk about uh, with robotics, and I, I think this is sort of the not as well discussed thing, but it's super, super important, is, is simulation. So once you actually get into like a big robot, like a, a robot uh, that's an autonomous vehicle or is a capital good, right? They're expensive, they're dangerous. Um, in terms of software as a programmer, they're slow, right? You, if you have a behavior you're working on, you may have to start your process, let the behavior start to queue up to get to the point that you're actually working on. Uh, and that all takes time. It's a very slow process actually software-wise. Um, another thing is these things are expensive. You may only have one and they have to be shared between you know 10 graduate students or 10 programmers. That's kind of a pain. Um, and another thing is just that whole testing paradigm that I, I said before. Uh, how do I, you know, I want to go run tests. Do I run tests on the robot when everyone's sleeping and they can't use it? Like you need a way to basically test behaviors and do regression tests and integration tests um, without having the physical hardware there. And so what ends up happening is we end up building simulations of robots all the time because it just makes our lives so much easier. Well, Ross has a sister library, Ignition Gazebo, that is just about simulation. And Ignition allows you to build a virtual robot. Um, you can basically take that 3D model, that ERDIF, and drop it into Gazebo. Um, it allows you to simulate the physics, other robots. It allows you to simulate sensors. And all of this happens playing very, very well with ROS2. So you can kind of take your code base, pick it up from the physical robot, drop it onto the simulation, and do all your work there. Do all your testing there. Do all your prototyping there. And then when you're fairly confident, then you can go back and drop it back on the robot and see how things are, are going. And this, this paradigm of doing things in simulation well before we do it in the real world, since computers are so powerful now and usually robots aren't, is, is sort of the way forward in how things are, are going. Um, I have a, this image on the right, this is a competition called ARIAC run by the National Institutes of Standard Technology where they just built this giant simulation, um, simulated factory floor and people could compete on performing different tasks and how they program them. Um, in terms of what comes with ROS, it's not just about these utilities that are sort of like core functionalities that I've described, but it's also, you know, what is the power of Python? The power of Python is that it's got batteries included, and ROS really is sort of like batteries included, but for these robotics, uh, for robotics applications. Um, as I said before, ROS has packages, and packages are just collections of code that you can go and grab and use in a variety of different languages. Um, and, you know, we keep an index of all of these different packages, or a lot of the different packages. And so you can go through that, um, that ROS index and see all of these different tools that you, you may potentially need to go and build your robot. Um, a lot of them are actually go through a fairly rigorous testing program. We have a whole build farm that builds and tests a lot of these packages and a lot of these packages in integration tests. Um, and it allows you to have all these, you know, 
cool parts of a robot that you'd never think about. So like one I always like to call out is this robot web tools. Um, if you want to go build a web-based interface for your robot, it's just there and it you can grab it and all of the ROS topics that you um, you know are running on your machine you can now expose through a web socket and start building a, a front end on top of it. So really, you know, like if there's things that you're good at and things that you're not good at, there's a chance that there's a ROS package that will like take care of all the things you're not good at. Um, along with these packages, you just have all of the hardware drivers, right? Which, you know, drivers have always been a problem on Linux. Um, but more and more and more, especially for robotics hardware, we're seeing um, hardware vendors build, you know, a ROS package and you pull in that package, it's got the drivers, it's got like all the API interfaces, it's got it down to you know the topic level, and you just sort of grab the package, build it, and run it, and you can go and, and play with all of this cool data or all these cool sort of components. Not quite at Lego like Lego Land yet, where you can just grab them all and they all kind of work, but we're getting kind of close. And it's not it's not this monumental task that I think it used to be. Um, along those lines, one of the big innovations I think in ROS2 is um, is basically we're, uh, groups have been working on what we're calling micro ROS, which micro ROS is basically a ROS2 um, interface to an RTOS. So you know, on all these different embedded systems now, it's running an RTOS because it's doing real time control, and there's now in that code you can actually just insert you know, a, a library and have it directly interface with ROS topics, which I think is amazing. Like this has always been something that's held us back. And now that there is a very, very clear path to ROS interacting with some of these real time systems, it's it's quite amazing. And I think the future with this is, is very, very bright. So those are, you know, I've talked about some of these features in, in ROS and ROS2 and how it makes your life easier to go build a robot. But even on top of that, there's a fairly substantial community of people who build these things. Um, if you're interested, I think the first place you kind of start is ross.org. Um, it's a little bit of an old website, but it'll point you in the direction of all of the community resources that we offer. Um, there's also um, the ROS2 documentation's in a little bit different spot. Um, so it's in index.ross.org. Um, but if you take a look in there, there's a fairly, I think we're like at the ROS core API documentation level, ROS2 uh, documentation is a basically parity. So if you go there, you can actually walk through a bunch of tutorials, a bunch of how to's, get familiar with the basics of ROS2. Um, we also have our own community discussion forum on Discourse. Um, it's fairly active. This is where people come and make their announcements, you know, post their cool new projects, talk about packages that they're building or want to build. Um, it's definitely worth checking in uh, on a regular basis. We also have our own Q&A website, which sort of predates Stack Overflow, so there's a lot of good and useful information on there. Um, if you're, you know, if you're having a problem with ROS, and I'm going to admit it's not always the easiest thing to use, you can go there, and more likely than not, a core dev or somebody who's very, very familiar will find and answer your question. You'll make some friends. Um, you'll sort of join this large community. Um, so, just wanted to point out that we, we've released ROS2 Foxy. We think this is sort of the release where we're saying, hey, if you're starting a new project, if you're going to upgrade, just go ahead and switch over to ROS2. It's the first major LTS of ROS2. Uh, so this, this version is going to have a three-year LTS, so we'll, be, um, we'll have three years of patches, three years of support, um, you know, and it's not it should be fairly easy to upgrade. It's not a monumental task if you already have a ROS1 application. Um, if you'd like to learn more uh, or get started with ROS, I can't tell you what you're able to do and not point you to a direction where you can get started and actually start building robots and understanding how they work. So um, DARPA has the SubT simulator, which SubT is a competition, sort of like the competition I mentioned earlier, uh, where they have robots navigating in subterranean environments. So they have a very, very big, complex simulated tunnel system that they have created. And you can actually build, um, no, they have pre-configured robots that you can drop in there and then you can start uh, programming them right away. 
and we've actually done a lot of work with them to help build out tutorials that should help you like learn how to use that nav stack, learn how mapping works, uh, learn how to do like basic perception tasks. And it's a really, especially now where people can't leave their houses as much, it's a really, really good way to get started without having to deal with the physical robot. And there are, there's a lot of things there that can actually help you uh, learn and grow and understand how, you know, how to be a roboticist. Um, along those lines, there's a sort of parallel community with, with Ross called AutoWare. So AutoWare is sort of the people building the next layer of shared resources on top of Ross, specifically directed at um, autonomous vehicles. Um, so we've been working with them to put together a set of tutorials where all these sort of, you know, um, luminaries in autonomous vehicles get together and talk for an hour on a subject that, that they're particularly good at. Um, they also have sort of this prepackaged Docker container with uh, simulation in it, so you can go and try it out too. So this is this is about halfway through right now, so I would go to take a look at it. And then finally, as I said before, there's the ROS2 docs. Um, there's tutorials and there's just really simple, basic tutorials that get these concepts that I've talked across. And hopefully those can help you understand at a, you know, a more specific level of like API and um, application development what's going on in ROS. And then finally, we also um, we also have a um, turtle bot that it's still made. We still sell them. Uh, if you want to pick one up, if you want a physical robot to actually go run around or play with the kids, they're still available. Um, so thanks. Uh, again, feel free to check out ROS.org. Uh, feel free to drop me a line. I'm here to answer questions. And yeah, thank you. Go build some robots. Weird. I don't hear anything. Uh, thanks for giving this talk. I've spoken to Russ Madrid. I'm just going to read off questions. Hopefully that's working. Let me. I got the speaker mic here. Hold on. See if anyone's saying anything to me. Uh, let's see. Stopping every 20 minutes. Uh, should I start with Ross 1 or just completely dive in with Ross 2? I would absolutely recommend starting with Ross 2 especially if you're building something for a long haul, if you're looking for, a, you're, you're going to get all the concepts, like you should be able to translate back and forth. Um, I think that's a, the best way to get started at this point. There, there's, it's still a little rough, but it's it's definitely a time to start switching over. Uh, I got a really long question here. The barriers are actually, we think more. <laughs> know what the big plans and initiatives from open robotics are to help bring down the complexity of ROS, both the perceived and actual complexity. Also, please tell open robotics that we can't wait to see them again at ROSCon. Yeah, so we, I, I, I'm well aware of the complexities working with ROS. So part of it is we just need to, um, I know this is not a not satisfying answer, but part of it is we first recognize that the things that we're doing are really hard, right? So, um, you know, no one says, oh, you know, what do we what do we do to make organic chemistry easy? And part of it is is, is that it's hard. You're just going to have to learn a bunch of stuff. Now, that said, um, the way I think things are approached and, and sort of discussed, I think Ross already does a lot better than, say, a lot of the academic literature on, on describing uh, robotics concepts. But I think for us, the challenge right now is to find resources and capabilities to really deliver content to people that gets them to where they need to be. And I think this is really important. I actually think this is a, a huge sort of economic issue in the sense of we need to train the people who are building the robots that built the future that we want to see. And so I think, you know, there's going to be more and more curricula sort of focused on not just building robots, but maintaining robots, developing with robots, etc. Everything's working okay, correct? Uh, is Gazebo included in the ROS installation, or do I need to install Gazebo? I believe you need to install Gazebo separately, because it's a separate package. Uh, let's see, other questions. Uh, that's all I see. Any, oh wait, is this more?
Well, so what hardware, okay, so there's this question, what hardware is required for beginners, especially kids? Um, so slowly, and some of those things I recommended at the end, so we're really approaching a place where um, you can teach robotics and you can teach software fundamentals about robotics without hardware. And that's the power of simulation, right? Um, because it's expensive and it's difficult to deal with and you have this problem in um, robotics hardware where kids get frustrated because they don't know if the software doesn't work or the hardware doesn't work and like that's an advanced debugging skill so i actually i, I really see a, a path forward for robotics with uh simulation being the way that you start teaching and then once you kind of get good at software or figure out what you want to do with software, then you drop it on the hardware and then you, you go there. So I, I actually think, you know, especially now with COVID, like software is the way to begin. Don't even worry about the hardware. Go build a simulation. And a couple of those resources, the AutoWare course I showed you, the ROS tutorials, the, the DARPA tutorials, they all kind of get to that really, really quickly where it's like, here's a simulation, go play with the simulation first. Let's see, do we still have swag for donations going on? Uh, T-shirt sale just ended actually. Uh, like last week, somebody, um, uh, yeah, t-shirts are over, but I think, you know, with the next release, there'll be more t-shirts. Do you hire at Open Robotics? Yes, we hire. We have to employ people. Are we hiring right now? Um, I think we're a little bit still that. I think there's some, might be positions at the Singapore office. Uh, is Rusty a placement for Ross 1? If not, ROS1 has its own use cases. I mean, I, I think ROS2 is a replacement for ROS1. I think, you know, I, I, replacement is not the right word. Um, replacement, you know, it's, is Python 3 a replacement for Python 2? And the answer is it's the evolution and software doesn't remain static and needs to be maintained. Um, so, yes. See, I work on embedded projects that run on custom hardware for fancy PTZ cameras. Been there. Uh, I'd love to convince our Python app developers how if ROS could be leveraged. Where do you think I could start? Are there any consultants that could um, help? You know, also specific use cases. So I don't have any. I can't actually recommend consultants just because of who we are and what we do. But um, specifically, but I, I actually think this is the place that we're missing a lot in, and, and that's the building. So I take the broad, uh, broad view on robots, where robots are anything with sensors, actuators, and control, versus the sort of narrow view that like a robot has to be like something you see in sci-fi. Um, so generally, all of these people that are talking about IoT sort of applications, well, kind of robotics is the same thing. So PTZ camera, um, I would start, you know, it, it's kind of, if you can, if you're comfortable working with some of the micro raw stuff, I'd give it a shot. I think as a framework for developing concepts around hardware, ROS is really, really good. And I wouldn't even think of it as a robot framework, more as like a hardware interface framework. Um, is ROS2, did I already cover this one? Is ROS2 a complete replacement for ROS1? If not, does ROS1 have its own use cases? Uh, ROS1 ROS has its own use cases in the sense that you are interfacing with other people's ROS1 stuff and you are building things that are ROS1 that are sort of, I don't even want to say legacy, that are kind of the state of the world. What we're trying to do is we're trying to, I, hopefully I made this clear. We are, if you're familiar with Python, we are at, it is in Python land, there is, uh, Python 2.7 and everyone had to switch over to 3.5, 3.6, um, You know, this wrapped up this year. Um, people really started pushing about 2015, 2016. We are, the analogy is ROS1, ROS2. We are at 2016, 2017. You need to be thinking about it. You need to be building around it. Uh, and it'll be worth your time to do so. Is there significant demand for parallel kinematics in Gazebo? Um, I can't answer that question well. I don't. I don't quite grok what parallel. What you mean by parallel kinematics? Like parallel robot, parallel robots running and doing ki kinematics. Um, I need more information to answer that, and it may not be a domain I'm particularly suited for. 
Any questions? Uh, any, anyway, I, I would feel like you guys can get at me directly on Twitter or we, like I said, we have Ross Discourse. I'm always trying to get people to come over there. That's sort of where we try to direct discussion. I don't know. This is kind of strange. I, I'm disembodied. I can't hear anything. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kind of looking at questions. Hello? Okay. Uh, well, I'll give it, how about we give it till, I have 12.50. Why don't we give it to 12.52? Any other questions? I hope I, you know, I'm not writing them out, but hopefully you guys are getting your answers. And feel free to, like, it's just cat at openrobotics.org. Just feel free to shoot me an email if you have questions. Going once, going twice. Well, thank you for having me. Um, like I said, there's a bunch of resources. We're really trying to get people to move over. Um, I, I definitely, having worked with ROS2 and ROS1 now, I definitely see um, why we want to do so and, and the advantages of doing such. Oh, oh, there's more questions. I, I can answer these all day. Uh, I've held roles from the start, and this seems like a big junk from the amount of tools that are exposed. Are big robotics companies like ABB, Motoman, KUKA, et cetera, playing with ROS today? Are there talks of them moving completely to ROS, or is that still far fetched dream? Uh, so, this is CRT Mori. I wouldn't say. So, the short answer is playing with using aware of, yes. Um, I wouldn't phrase this as like a all or nothing thing. I think there's room in the world for a diversity of, you know, manufacturing. And just my experience with manufacturing, um, I think there's a slow march towards Ross. I don't think it's good. You know, there's not going to be a day where all of a sudden everyone switches over. Um, I think people are becoming more and more aware of, you know, what we offer in terms of making sort of big strides and big improvements in robotics. That that said, you know, robotics is a very capital intensive, um, you know, long life cycle thing in manufacturing. And so that process is very slow, but I think there's a lot of curiosity now. And I think there's a lot of realization that, you know, we're, you know, we're the set of people that are working on this domain of bringing, you know, high tech, interesting stuff out into the world. Uh, but Singapore roles require permanent residency. At least do you hire people on the go without any visa restrictions? I can't, I'm not HR. I can't answer that question. That's a question that goes to our website. Um, what is supporting effort to port a package to Rust 1 to Rust 2? Um, I'm, you know, I don't think it's that, I haven't done it myself personally. So I, I got to preface it with that. I've talked to people at Ross Industrial, um, and a few other people who've done it, it's not that bad if you're, you know, if you're, if you're good at keeping your unit tests up and being mindful. And if you're on like, you know, sea turtle, right, it's going to take you a whole long time to get from Ross 1 to Ross 2. If you are on noetic or melodic and you work slowly and you have good unit tests, the process of transitioning is probably not as bad. It depends on some of your packages and where they're at. There's the ROS1 to ROS2 bridge, which I think helps that process move along a lot smoother. Uh, Zhang says, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, let's see, Gino, what is the state of ROS2 for parallel robots? So like, par like, are you talking, I guess that I need more information. Is ROS suitable for small robotic systems like RPI? Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Um, you know, getting things to build on RPIs and stuff like that can be a pain, but uh, it's perfectly suitable. Um, oh, the other thing I was going to say about people asking about ROS 1 to ROS 2 transitions, I, just a couple hours ago I found out uh, 
Michael Ferguson, who built the URB1, which is basically kind of like a smaller PR2 robot, he found one on Craigslist, bought it, and and basically moved it from Ross 1 to Ross 2 over a weekend. And he's going to talk about it on a Zoom meeting like tomorrow or today or something, which I, I think that's going to be super interesting. Uh, you need to move the page if this pops up. Um, what is about certifications on industrial usage? Um, so I can't, I'm not super abreast of what's going on in, in that domain. I know there is some efforts that certain organizations are working particularly hard, particularly at like AutoWare on certifying uh, Ross and, you know, Ross in particular for certain applications. Right now, those tend to be sort of uh, an organization driven value add. I internally, you know, I think if there were a little bit more push, I think that could happen, but there's certainly people doing it. We are helping them at times, but we're not necessarily doing all of it, I think is roughly what's going on, but I'm not completely sure about that. Okay, any any more questions? Oh, looks like there's another page already. Uh, slides, nope. Slides be shared, yes, slides should be shared. one okay I think I've seen all of these are like numbered but they're not in order okay any last questions cool if no one has I think I saw one more. Would the slides be shared? Yes. Rust support for serial manipulators is very mature. How easy is model simulate? Like, okay, a Delta robot. I think I five bar robots. Uh, yeah, okay. I see what you're saying. I think there's still some in Gazebo. I think there's still some limitations on. On like five bar linkages, if I if last I heard, because I was kind of asking about that a couple months ago. That said, I will say that there's pretty active development on Ignition Gazebo just in terms of like souping up both the performance and the capabilities. Um, but I don't know, I'm not as familiar on the Gazebo side um, and particularly like the ERDIF side of if and when that'll be possible, whether it's a ticket and where it's at. So that's a little bit, you know closer to the maintainer down in the weeds question. That's a, that's a, like, that's a Ross discourse question. Cause I, I don't know that, but somebody else probably does. Uh, okay. I am not, I think that was 26. Oh, uh, here's another one. Karthik, uh, Poduval, Ross one. I did not allow camera metadata Ross to support that. I don't quite understand the question. Um, I mean, there's a metadata topic, um, more or less. I, I don't understand the, the question. Uh, okay, I'm not seeing any more questions, so I'm going to assume we're done. Give it. We got a question hit in our, even if it's imperfect. Okay, I'm, well, I'm gonna, strangely not getting any feedback or hearing anything, so I'm gonna say I think we're done. I uh, appreciate you guys showing up. Uh, let me know uh, everything, you know, most of the things are open. Check out all those resources I pointed out. I believe I sent over the slides. They should be able to point you to them. If not, I'm happy to share them with you. Cool, have a good day.